Good morning, everyone. Good morning, J.D. Thurman. <laughs> I'm Jack Stoltz. I will be your MC for today. I missed it last year due to the uh, tangle in uh, Orlando where all the flights got canceled and they said, we'll get you there by Tuesday night. And I said, that's not going to work. So Ray Carpenter filled in for me. This year, Ray is not here. And I personally counseled him because I said, what's more important, coming to AUSA or going to Cancun with your family? <laughs> so when you see him, you can counsel him also. But no, it, it's great to be here. Uh, some have commented, I've got a little fuzz around my face. This is COVID, okay? When my wife and I were locked up by ourselves in our house, because of COVID, I said, I'm not cutting my hair, I'm not shaving. <laughs> and so about a year later, I said, it's time to come out. <laughs> I'm going to cut my hair and shave. And she said, can you leave a little bit around the, the mouth? So I did it for her. <laughs> it's not for me. I'm not trying to make a statement. I'd like at first to call on our chaplain, Brigadier General Retired Bob Paskowski, to come up and give our blessing. Let's pray together. Loving God, you're always with us. Every minute of every day, we ask you to touch our hearts to feel your presence here among us this morning. Thanks for calling us together here this morning, this early morning to celebrate the work and service and achievements of our Guard and Reserve, their soldiers, the families, the civilians that support them, and their employers as well. What a great way to kick off this AUSA event with this breakfast. May we enjoy this time of fellowship together to renew old friendships and to make new ones. We pray that our time together is both productive and enjoyable. Bless and protect all of our citizen warriors and those who love them, whether they are on or off duty, in training, especially if on duty and deployed to places near and far away and in harm's way. Help us all to do our best. Help us all to open our hearts to you so that we can build up your kingdom of peace. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. As I mentioned, I'll be your host today for the Robert Moorhead uh, Garden Reserve Breakfast. Breakfast is an opportunity for us to hear from the leadership of the Garden Reserve Forces and the Force Com Commander. And it's also a special time for us to recognize soldiers and civilians for special achievements, as well as their AUSA chapters, their leaders and members for excellence. This breakfast is named in honor of Major General Robert G. Moorhead. He was the Major General in the rank in the Indiana National Guard, served as the 38th Division Commander, served as Deputy Commander for U.S. Training Doctrine Command, and was the a volunteer and served as President and CEO of AUSA. So a long storied career with AUSA. Now let me introduce some of our special guests that we have here with us tonight, or to this morning. I'm still on nighttime. Uh, General Dan Hokinson, Chief of the National Guard Bureau. Thanks for being here. And I can tell you and John Jensen, I especially appreciate you living in Florida with what we're watching down there and the heroics the National Guard is doing in Florida. <laughs> General Andrew Pappas, our guest speaker, who I will introduce later. <laughs> Mr. Mario Diaz, the Deputy Undersecretary of the Army.
Lieutenant General John A. Jensen, Director of Army National Guard, and Command Sergeant Major John Raines, Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard. <laughs> Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, Chief of the Army Reserve, Command Sergeant Major Andrew Lombardo. <laughs> and Com Command Sergeant Andrew Lombardo, Command Sergeant Major of the Army Reserve. <laughs> and my old friend and battle buddy, Chief Warrant Officer 5, Pat Nelligan, Command Chief Warrant Officer. <laughs> Brigadier General Jack Haley, Vice President, Membership and Meetings for AUSA and our Annual Meeting Chair. <laughs> Lieutenant General Thomas Todd, United States Army Futures Command. Lieutenant General Mike Howard, European Command. <laughs> Lieutenant General Donna Martin, the U.S. Army Inspector General. <laughs> Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen, Chief of Staff, G9. <laughs> Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, Deputy Commander, Northern Command. Good to see you, AC. <laughs> Lieutenant General Andrew Rowling, U.S. Army, Europe and Africa. <laughs> Lieutenant General Richard Kaufman, Army Futures Command. <laughs> Lieutenant General Joe Anderson, U.S. Army, retired. And our old friend, Lieutenant General Guy Swan, U.S. Army retired and a senior fellow at AUSA. Good to see you, Guy. <laughs> On behalf of General Brown and AUSA, let me thank our national partner, sponsor for their support of today's forum. Our sponsor is Light Fighter Systems, LLC. Light Fighter is a family-owned, VA-certified, service-disabled veteran business. All three owners are Army combat veterans, Vietnam and Iraq. Light Fighter is the leading provider of lightweight, backpackable shelter systems. Light Fighter asks that you stop at their booth, which is 8341 this week, to see their new stealth thermal management shelter technologies. Of course, you won't be able to see them because they're stealth. <laughs> All Light Fighter products are made in America. Light Fighter is represented by their president, Colonel Retired Rich Cochise. His wife, Kay. <laughs> along with the company CEO, Mike Cochise. Also, we're honored to have in attendance this morning a room full of special guests and senior members of the Army leadership. We would like to highlight the recipients of the 2022 McLean and Ruddle, Rudder Medals. Major General Jill K. Ferris. And Command Sergeant Major Arthur Leak, U.S. Army retired. We have a number of our AUSA board members, region presidents, and senior fellows present with us this morning. Now I'd like to, for the following outstanding soldiers to stand and be recognized as they are introduced. Now I will tell you up front, some of these I did not have who they were, <laughs> what units and everything, so I'm just going to introduce them. The Army National Guard Best Squad, please stand. Where are you guys from? All over, okay. <laughs> That's why I didn't say a unit. <laughs> I 
Okay. The Army Reserve Best Squad. Sergeant First Class Mark W. Mercer, Army Reserve Career Counselor of the Year. Sergeant First Class Giovanna Avila, Army Reserve Recruiter of the Year. And Staff Sergeant Lauren A. Pope, Army Reserve Drill Sergeant of the Year. My final intro to you this morning is our AUSA staff who work with the reserve components in their priorities and actions. Lieutenant, Re Lieutenant Colonel retired Mark Wolf, the Deputy Director of Army National Guard and Reserve Affairs for AUSA. And assisting Mark is a familiar face, an old friend who agreed to come back and help out the former Assistant Director for National Guard Affairs, Colonel Retired Stan Crow. <laughs> now, enjoy your breakfast. You can talk all you want. <laughs> I'm going to go sit down. And then I'll be back up here in a few minutes to uh, continue the program. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue with our program. You can c continue to eat, drink coffee, do whatever you want to do. Um, but at this time, I'm going to call Lieutenant Colonel Retired Stan Crow to come up and we can proceed with some of our award ceremony. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Colonel Retired Stan Crow. Uh, I was on the other side out there with you all for many years in the AUSA staff, and uh, I really congratulate uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Wolf for the great job he does. And uh, the portion of the agenda we have today, <clears throat> there's a gentleman in here, uh, Bill Beiswinger, who uh, uh, did this portion of the program for many years, and I want to salute him because he's done great. Uh, it is a joy to be with you all with the Army of uh, the reserve component of the Army with the Army National Guard and Army Reserve folks. Many of you are friends of mine. And uh, this is the first major event kicking off the annual meeting with the reserve component, so it's a really big deal. Uh, I would like to go ahead into the portion of the script with the uh, Kerwin Awards. When U.S. Army Forces Command was established in 1973, it was charged with the readiness of all Army units in the United States Army. The first commander of that organization, General Walter T. Kerwin, Jr., dedicated himself to the task of preparing all Army elements. In recognition of his great contribution to the reserve components, the three associations represented here, AUSA, the National Guard Association of the United States, Arm, the United States and the Reserve Officers Association, jointly established the Walter T. Kerwin Jr. Readiness Award. And this is to recognize annually the outstanding Army National Guard and Army Reserve unit for that year. Uh, the selection process is difficult. The Chief of the National Guard Bureau, who is here, General Hokinson, se selects the Army National Guard unit and the Commanding General of the United States Army Reserve Command selects the Army Reserve unit. It is presented to the unit with the highest level of readiness in its respective component. To be considered, each unit must have, rated, have been rated as having superior performance in eight specific areas, as well as meeting other criteria. At this time, would General Pappas and Lieutenant General Stoltz please join me on the stage.
Uh, over here, you have the Kerwin Awards. The, ins uh, the word includes the inscription. Today, combat-ready reserve forces are more important to our nation's security than they have ever been in our history. Walter T. Kerwin, Jr. And while he was alive, he attended this ceremony. Uh, I was with him on several of them, and he took great pride in this award. Given the broad competition, every member of the winning unit can take great justifiable pride in his or her contribution to the Army's readiness. Would Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Griffin and Command Sergeant Major Lindsey Jackson come up to the stage to accept the award for the 203rd Military Intelligence Battalion? The citation, the citation reads, oh, no, wait, just a moment, sorry. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. The citation reads, the Walter T. Kerwin Jr. Readiness Award for the Army's Most Outstanding Reserve Unit The Walter T. Kerwin Jr. Readiness Award for the Army's Most Outstanding Reserve Unit is presented to the 203rd Military Intelligence Battalion, Gunpowder, Maryland, of the U.S. Army Reserve. The 203rd Military Intelligence Battalion epitomized the Military Intelligence Readiness Command's motto of always engaged throughout uh, the year 2021 by conducting high-level training for the United States military-only Tech Int Operations Course. The 203rd MI Battalion provided operational technical intelligence activities and expeditionary deployment operations, certifying over 50 soldiers, foreign partners, and interagency personnel during the year 2021. The 203rd MI Battalion is a high achieving unit whose actions speak volumes. They are one of the Army Reserve's finest. This unit's performance reflects great credit upon themselves the United States Army Reserve, and the United States Army. And it's her birthday today. Oh, and it's her God. birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. And it's her birthday today. <laughs> Would Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Combs come up to the stage to accept the award for the 2nd Squadron, 107th Cavalry? Yes. Yeah, and we have the State Sergeant, Command Sergeant Major coming up. The Walter T. Kerwin Jr. Readiness Award for the Outstanding Army National Guard Unit is the 2nd Squadron, 107th Cavalry Regiment of the Ohio Army National Guard. The 2nd Squadron, 107th Cavalry, distinguished itself by achieving the highest standards in training and readiness, as well as demonstrated excellence in operational planning, execution of training, and maintaining high readiness standards. The 2nd Squadron, 107th Cavalry's overall combat readiness and the unit's performance with, with respect to all other Army National Guard units in personnel strength, weapons qualification, unit manning, skill level qualification, retention, drill attendance, and supply operations were second to none. Finally, the squadron provided outstanding support to communities throughout the state of Ohio, mobilized in support of the National Capital Region, and achieved resounding success during JRTC Rotation 21-08. The 2nd Squadron 107th Cavalry is currently mobilized in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. Their service reflects great credit upon themselves, the 37th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, the Ohio Army National Guard, and the United States Army.
Let's, let me make sure I didn't leave somebody out. <laughs> okay. At this time, I'd like to invite Lieutenant General John Jensen, the director of the Army National Guard, to come to the podium and give us a few remarks about his feelings about the National Guard and where they are. And let me reiterate before John gets up here. If you were in Florida, like I was the last few weeks, you saw National Guard soldiers, not from just Florida. I think there were National Guard soldiers from 15 other states deployed across Florida doing rescue, bringing food, bringing water, you name it. So thanks, John. Thanks, Jack. I, uh, I appreciate that. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Jack, it's great to have you back. Uh, the best thing I can say about you is you're no Ray Carpenter, <laughs> but none of us are. Uh, but it's great to be back together after two years of uh, uh, disruption uh, for this event. If you remember, two years ago, uh, we didn't conduct AUSA, and then last year, uh, we didn't do the full breakfast, and we were limited on how many people uh, could come to this event. It's just great to see everybody back here together. And to Rich, Kay, and Mike, thanks so much for the Light Fighter team for, for sponsoring this event and just being great, great partners. Yeah. General Hokinson, good morning. Thanks for joining us. General Pappas, as always, it's great to have the Force Comm Commander here. Uh, you joined us at, at, at Naugus, and it's great to have, uh, have you here uh, as part of this uh, event, too. And to all the distinguished uh, visitors, uh, good morning. Uh, first off, again, congratulations to the soldiers and leaders of the 203rd Military Intelligence Battalion of the Army Reserve and 2nd Squadron, 107th Cav of the o Ohio Army National Guard. And I don't know if you caught General Stoltz's last uh, part of uh, that award uh, as the Walter T. Kerwin Award winner for the Army Guard. We decided to deploy the CAV squadron. and they're currently at Fort Bliss, so congratulations for that. Uh, on their way to Operation Inherit Resolve. But I, but I really know the, the tremendous amount of commitment it, it, it takes uh, to get to this level of recognition. And so to, bo to both organizations, congratulations and well done. Uh, I'd also like to note um, that, you know, as we were introduced this morning, we have the Army National Guard best squad team uh, that was here and the uh, Army Reserve uh, best squad team. Why, why are they here? Why are they in town? Unlike the rest of us, they actually earned the right to come to AUSA. Um, they, they, they finished in the top four United States Army's inaugural best squad competition. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think just a, a tremendous statement about, about the commitment uh, of our reserve component soldiers across the Army Reserve, reserve and the Army National Guard. And Jody, Jody, it's great to see you again. Good morning. Great to share the, the stage with you again this year. And a little plug for additional reserve component activity uh, events this week. Later today, 1,500 to 1,600, my command our Major CSM uh, John Raines will lead a breakout session with four other Army Guard uh, Sergeant Majors and Command Sergeant Majors. Um, tomorrow's a busy day. The Chief of the Army Reserve has her seminar at 08. Uh, I follow with the Army Guard seminar at 1030. Uh, both of those events are in room 145. Uh, we close out tomorrow's session again with the Guard and the Reserve reception at 1700. CSM Lombardo, I believe you have a session on Wednesday morning then at uh, at 0830. So we'd like to really see everybody uh, attend those uh, events and, and learn a little bit more about what your Army Reserve and Army National Guard are doing. And uh, you know, every time we come together in a forum like that, I think we should be reminded again of all, all of our soldiers that are currently deployed overseas and here in the United States. And for the Army National Guard, uh, as of yesterday morning, uh, that included 36,620 soldiers. Uh, 12,600 soldiers mobilized in a Title 32 or state active duty status, supporting missions as diverse as post-hurricane relief operations in Puerto Rico and Florida, wildfire missions in New Mexico, uh, and migrant support and escort in, in three states. To all the people impacted by Hurricanes Fiona 
And Ian, uh, our prayers are with you as you continue to recover from these devastating and tragic events. In a federal status, we have uh, almost 24,000 soldiers mobilized across the globe uh, to include Gitmo, OIR, OSS, K4, Horn of Africa, uh, JTMGU, Southwest Border, and uh, National Capital Region, IADS, just to, just to name a couple of our missions. And we're so proud of these soldiers as they continue to meet the call of their, of their nation and their army across the globe. But this week at uh, AUSA, uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be focused on the future. Uh, the theme for AUSA 2022 is building the Army of 2030. And I know it's uh, no surprise to the senior leaders in this room that the Army is currently in transition. We are moving into the future as rapidly as our imagination, our processes, and our budgets can support. We know that we have to transition from our Army of just a couple years ago because the strategic environment across the globe has changed. Our mission hasn't changed. We are still required to deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars as part of the joint force, wherever and against whomever our national leadership determines. This is a daunting task, but this has been the Army's task since our founding. And as senior, senior leaders, we know that transitions are always risky and potentially dangerous. That is why we spend so much time when transitioning units in theater to minimize this risk. Transitions bring friction as well. We have to be aware of this risk and work to reduce it when identified. Our ongoing transition to the Army of 2030 and then to the Army of 2040 is no different. Our nation demands that we get this right. We must get this right. And so I think there's two, from my perspective, there are two items that I believe that are incredibly important to getting this transition right. First off, our continued focus on and commitment to our soldiers as the critical enabler of our success. The Army is first and foremost a people-centric organization. Our primary focus is on organizations of people and not organizations of equipment. Again, no surprise to anyone here, but we are, in a we are recruiting in a very challenging environment and a very challenging time right now. It will take everyone's focus and effort to overcome this challenge. In the Army National Guard, we are focused on reconnecting to the young men and young women of America. Propensity to serve starts with connection. It is our responsibility to connect with America and our communities. We will meet that challenge. If 75% of today's young adults know little to nothing about our Army, then it's our responsibility to fix this. We will get out and reconnect with America. Being positioned in over 2,200 communities across America gives us that advantage and requires us to lead the charge in turning our recruiting results around. Sure, there are multiple enablers to this effort, recruiting bonuses, marketing, and so on, but success will be determined by our physical presence and our ability to connect, because we are in the people business. Secondly, during this transition, we have to remain a united army, a total army. There are, different, there are difficult decisions to be made into the future about our army and what our nation can afford. Army leaders across the force have to remain together and move the total army forward. Teamwork and collaboration are essential during our Army's transition. No one has all the answers, but through collaboration throughout the force, we can come up with the best solution to the problems ahead of us. So as we march forward towards the Army of 2030 and 2040, I say let's march along together. So I'm sure I've used up my allotted time this morning. I'd like to thank everybody again for attending today's breakfast. Have a tremendous conference uh, this week, and I'll, I'll see everybody uh, in the hallways, in the uh, seminars, and of course, uh, on the floor with our great in, uh, industry partners. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite the Chief Army Reserve, Commanding General of the Army Reserve Command, Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, to come.
come up and make some remarks. Good morning, everyone. So thank you, General Stultz. It's always great to see one of our classic cars back in, back in business here, out to advocate for us. General Hokinson, um, General Pappas, John, it's great to see you. Fellow General Officers, Command Chief Warrant Officers, Command Sergeants Major, distinguished guests, fellow soldiers and supporters of the U.S. Army. It is, as John said, really great to be back here in person with all of you fine folks. Um, and it's really been able to, a great privilege to be able to talk about some of those awesome things that all of our soldiers, units, and the components are doing all, uh, all for our nation. A big thanks to AUSA and Light Fighter for helping us come, come together this morning. And as John mentioned, there's lots of activities this week, Guard and Reserve, so we hope to see you all at all those different events. So this time last year, the Army Reserve was really trying to get back to in-person training. But over the past training year, we've run into some challenges particularly with the resurgence of the COVID Omicron variant. But that didn't stop us from meeting our gift map requirements. We had over 12,000 soldiers headed to 25 countries around the globe this past year, plus all of those who returned from those assignments. Nor did it stop us from getting back to large-scale training events, such as Global Medic, CSTXs, and every CTC rotation and warfighter exercise. Not to mention, more than 100 Army Reserve units and nearly 5,000 soldiers participated in exercises across the globe. How many people can say that their dual pursuits took them to Romania, to Korea, or Morocco? It's pretty cool. But what also happened across the past two plus years is that we've atrophied in how we do training management. Battle assemblies have become focused on getting all of our admin chores done. And then those chores kept us away from training. So in April, I published a paper that was called Changing Culture, Moving from Metrics to Readiness. And I met with all the leadership teams. We talked about how to reinvigorate training, tough, realistic training done safely. Step away from the stoplight charts. Re-energize training, training management, maintenance, and maintenance management. Focus on metal tasks. Division and brigade leaders, they must help train battalion and company teams. Leaders must have presence, whether it's physical or through clear commander's intent and spot checking. This is, as John mentioned, you know, connectedness. We've got to be connected. And I believe that by putting this emphasis on tough, realistic training done safely, we will make great strides towards our recruiting and retention goals. When our soldiers have something relevant, meaningful, purposeful, exciting to talk about on Monday when they go back to class or to the office, then we're on the right path. For example, the National Guard 2nd Squadron 107th Cavalry or our own 203rd MI Battalion have obvious accomplishments that they can share when they go back to work, as do Sergeant First Class Mercer, Sergeant First Class Avia, and Staff Sergeant Pope, not to mention both of our best squad Congratulations to all of you for being among the Army's best. But it's not enough to share those accomplishments and those stories here. Those of us already know that these folks are awesome. We need every soldier to have experiences that they are proud to share. And I ask that everyone here help by telling those stories, sharing those experiences, so that many others get excited about the prospect of serving. This year, we're also taking a hard look at what capabilities should the Army grow in the Army Reserve out in order to support the Army of 2030 and 2040. While we've been enabler heavy since 1993, the Army Reserve Force also has tremendous civilian skills. And we want to leverage both to give our soldiers dual pursuits. We're interested in your thoughts and welcome conversation on this topic during our panel session tomorrow. So in summary, the, Army, the top Army Reserve priorities for the next year are to grow every soldier through tough, realistic training done safely, grow the force through stories told to the American public by our soldiers about their purposeful experiences, and to design the Army Reserve Force for 2030 and 2040. You can help us with all of these efforts through your support, your ideas, and by enlightening the rest of the American population 
as to the rewards of being a member of the Total Army team. Shaping the force of the future takes both military and community leaders. So we're asking for your support and encouraging our communities, cities, campuses, congressional districts, and our employers located therein to see themselves as partners in national security, not only for sharing their best talent with us, but encouraging their employees to also serve. Thanks for your time and your support. Ready now, shaping tomorrow. It's now my distinct privilege to present the commander of the Forces Command in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the largest Army command. Uh, and he can tell you how many soldiers and how many families he's responsible for. But it includes the Army Reserve Forces. It uh, includes oversight of the National Guard training and readiness and it includes all active duty forces in the continental U.S. General Andrew Pop Pappas, he's a Wisconsin native, I just found out, a 1988 graduate of West Point, spent his early years down the street in 3rd Infantry Regiment as the 82nd Air Airborne Division paratrooper. Interspersed with tours as a foreign area officer in Greece and on the Joint Staff. 2006, he deployed to Iraq while in command of the 82nd Airborne's 573 CAV squadron. Later, he deployed three times to Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne Division while commanding its first BCT as the division's D D uh, DCG for operations. And finally, in 2018, as the 101st Division commander. General Pappas also served several senior tours in the Pentagon most recently as the J-3 and director of the Joint Staff. This past summer, he returned to Fort Bragg and assumed command of FORSCOM and is dedicated to ensure the training and readiness of our 740,000 soldiers across the Army's three components. He is a true American hero, but more importantly, he is a soldier soldier. That's what he cares about. So General Pappas, please come and address him. Jack, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me here today. And Mike, for you and Light Fighter, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I truly appreciate it. But I gotta admit, I didn't know that Cancun was one of the options for this. <laughs> yeah, you learn something every day. Hey, and uh, for the best squad, I see they walked out, though. Though we didn't know which unit they're from, they damn sure same, shared the same barber. It was good to see them. <laughs> Man, what a privilege to be here. And it is great to see the West Point cadets that are here. You talk about future leaders for tomorrow. And uh, a little story for that in a moment. But last night, you know, we're doing this kickoff breakfast. No better place to be. But with that, last night, you know, you got the 10 miler on Sunday. You got to get a little dehydrated, good run, good way to start the, uh, the long week. And then come that night, usually throughout the day on Sunday, you, you've got all the different units that get together. You, you know, we had the gathering of the Eagles last night, so 100 some old 101st people. The reserves, Jody's my neighbor, and you see this just cross flow of people. And though it said it was from 430 to 1830 to about 2030, 2230 last night, I looked at Jody, and, and you always get a good non-commissioned officer, SR Major Rains this morning, I said, you know, this, this kickoff breakfast is a great idea, but it might be a better idea to do a kickoff lunch, maybe. Get a, <laughs> everybody loves a Ranger sleep plan. But uh, the last thing I'll say when I look at the, the West Point cadets here, uh, there's one of the nine commissioned officers is up there, Sarah Murdoch. She's the E-4 attack NCO. She came in and we'd surfed together on two different tours to Afghanistan. And she came in and she had her phone. She goes, hey, you know, General Papa. She goes, look, there's a picture of you. And I was a cadet. She goes, you used to have hair. And I looked at him like, you know, I'm not Benjamin Buttons. I wasn't born 50, man. But it was, it was good to see her. And it just brought back, and seeing you guys here today, it is a good reflection of youth, and I'm glad you're here, because you see how the enterprise operates. 
You're going to come in, you're going to show your leadership, but as you see and continue to grow, don't worry, you will lose your hair, it happens. But the ability to lead at Echelon continuing forward. But coming here today, as I said, it's especially exciting for me. So I'm going to my 35th year, 35th year in the Army, and, and in that time, I've never been to AUSA completely for everything. A few years back in the Joint Staff, I grabbed my 11-year-old son at the time, so it was seven years ago, and took him here to grab trinkets, and he was excited. But I never hit any of the actual forums. And, you know, I was either preparing to deploy, deploying, or fighting, you know, the less than direct combat operations while in the Pentagon. So coming here today, coming here today is an absolute privilege, and spending the week here. Um, but I've got a learning curve this year. But I'm looking forward to being part of all of the action. I want to go out there. I want to be, be hitting all the exhibits on the floor. I'm looking forward to hearing the panels as they take, as move forward. And I saw, I heard, you know, Mike, Mike, are you out there? Mike Howard, they called his name. I was looking. He, he's recently retired, but he's out of UConn. But I had to check. He's not in uniform. I didn't know if he'd grown a beard like Jack or grew his hair long. Had to look for a ponytail. But it, when we're talking about war fighting, Indo-PACOM, Europe, the peninsula. These panels are absolutely imperative, and it's going to provide us all great insights. And then also the ceremonies that take place, honoring the key, key individuals. And I think it's appropriate that we started by honoring the Guard and Reserve's most ready formations. Yeah, I'd just like to have another round of applause for the 203rd and the second of the 107. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important, especially with the CAV troop, as we build readiness. We have to use that readiness and be able to deploy it forward. You know, our chief, the chief says it. We fight where we're told and we win where you fight. So we have to have that level of readiness. And the readiness of those two units, it demonstrates it's the kind that allows soldiers to fight and deliver the unique capabilities of war in the Guard and the Reserve. We all know that levels of readiness it just doesn't happen by accident. Anybody that's been in the field that's had, to, had a goal to get to and had a deployment on the horizon knows what it takes. It takes leadership. It takes very hard work. Most importantly, and that's on the part of their NCOs and the first-line leaders, I'm looking at the cadets, I'm looking at the sergeants out there, being personally engaged with the soldiers. Jody talked about that, engaged leadership. But it's also that the high standards and the mission focus, it starts at the top. And it's through these units' command teams. And it's all the way up to the senior leaders. You heard it from John Jensen over there, Sergeant Major, and with Jody. Leadership makes a difference. And I look at all the tags and the reserve commanders. We look to you to drive that readiness and hold everybody to that high standard. It's a solemn duty. Leaders set the conditions for readiness. That's our job. So I want to publicly thank Jody. I want to thank John, Dan Hokinson, General Hokinson who I've been able to serve with on the Joint Staff and watch. What a great ambassador for everybody, driving readiness and a true gentleman. For another strong year of leadership of our Guard and Reserve soldiers who are necessary for our nation's defense. I got to tell you, John and Jody, I've known for a long time, through Capstone and all, Jody, they've made this morning speech as an easy one to give. Because not only because of the readiness they've built across their formations, but also because they've already said everything that needs to be said about their soldiers' achievements, their value, and the priorities for 2023 and beyond. And even though the Army's first fiscal year in 20 years without a direct combat deployment, the demand has been extremely high. The combatant commanders have requirements across this world, and you see the demand, the request for forces continuing to build. And the reserve component soldiers, they continue to mobilize and serve overseas. Just the other week, I was over in Germany, and I got to meet with some of while I was there, then up in Graf, and it's great. Their presence alone is galvanizing the alliances of NATO. I also saw that element that was out there, and they're training the Ukrainian soldiers. They're training them how to fight the 105, out there training, training them how to do maintenance, how to sustain, how to lead, what mission command that 2014 forward our reserve forces and guard forces have built. It was great to see. And you talk about an attentive audience, those Ukrainians had just come out of combat. They knew what they were learning it was going to be applied the moment they went back. There's no R&R. &R. Back to the front line. Very attentive, very focused, and very personal to them. But that's just one theater, just one. There's many more of their peers are working hard to secure U.S. interests across the globe. That includes right here on the home front. 
We saw the Guard soldiers responding to floods in Florida, and we've already seen all the commitment continuing down in Florida today and all throughout the Southeast. So thank you for that commitment, taking care of Americans here at home. But as both John and Jody alluded to, we're also racing to meet another demand on the total Army. While it's not a requirement that appears in the gift map, everybody knows what a gift map is, that's your annual allocation, the SECDEF signs, uh, that's, that's your orders for the next year, or current command, command request for forces coming in. The current window of opportunity to transform our Army to fight and win the next war is nonetheless driving the way we expend our precious resources of training, time, and personnel. The Guard and Reserve will continue to have a very important role in all these efforts. The, rever the Reserve components combine 506,000 soldiers, factor into every major Army decision about resources. It's about readiness and about modernization. And that's because it's like the two of the 2nd and the 107th Cav Squadron, you provide value operational capacity that we have to have like the second of the, second of the third MI battalion, it's a unique strategic depth. And in each one of these, having sat in the tank, I'll give a compliment to General Hokinson, guard equities are championed, they're highlighted, and every decision is fully informed. So thanks, Dan, for being able to provide that for the group writ large. And it's the capacity and the depth was clear to me long before I took command of Forest Com this past July. So that's, I see you, that's 90 days. My 90-day assessment's due next week, so I'm finishing that off. But as I worked my way through this first 90-day assessment, of all the units' readiness and the challenges, I gained a much greater and clearer appreciation for the Guard and Reserves, their training priorities, the enduring impacts from COVID, and as Jody put it, the potential to reimagine the balance between the AC and the RC capabilities ahead of our next large-scale combat operation commitments. And it's imperative. We have to come in with rigor and understanding to balance the Army properly so that we can fight and win that next fight. And I'm excited to continue to engage with you and the teams throughout this week at AUSA, but even more importantly, I'm going to continue to engage the TPUs and the M-Day soldiers in the field and in your AOs wherever I have that possibility to help continue to inform. And I'll admit up front, when I looked at the Guard and Reserve, I had a better understanding of the Guard but not so much the reserve, and Jody's been educating me, because whenever we deployed for each one of those, whether it's brigade command, through division command, or even as a squadron commander, whenever you get a formation in combat, it's already C1. It's ready, it's been trained, and you can use that. What I never had an appreciation for is what it takes to develop and create that level of readiness. And it is hard work. And as I projected through my own misunderstanding, you know, an active duty component, it is much harder in Compo 2 and Compo 3. And I appreciate Jody taking me under her wing and continuing to teach me. But when I do, and the more I learn, I'm particularly interested in the Guard Reserve interest and continued progress along those four lines of effort that I know John and Jody are already familiar with. And they're using their own engagements with their force. First, we have got to win our soldiers' trust and keep ready, cohesive teams together throughout culminating missions. And this all relates to what I talked about earlier about leadership, personal engagement. I talk about engaged leadership, that trust. And I know everybody with a PhD or the SAMS grads that say you can't put a quantifier in front of leadership. Well, I did. Engaged leadership. That's that personal engagement. Because whether your duty days are five days a week, seven days a week, or two days a month, engaged leaders are the ones that start today. The they're present, they're visible, it's face to face. And it's with their people. And as I say, it starts at 0630. Platoon leaders are out there. Squad leaders are there. They're seeing the soldiers in their squad as they look down. That's not the time for dental appointments or anything. That's when you build that team starting at 630. You've heard me say this before. And that's when you know the personal issues that a soldier has. Because you have that discussion at the team leader level. The squad leader. Platoon sergeant, platoon leader. That's that core fundamental element that wins the first fight. And we've got to keep them together. And we can't get to a level of C1 and you come out of a culminating event that JRTC and NTC and you're ready and we high five and we move people out. That erodes the trust. We got to keep them together through deployments going forward. I always say it's like football. And though I'm a Packers fan, they, they messed up yesterday. And uh, I'll, I'll hold back on the profanity. But you don't go through the preseason 
to get to that apex ready for the, the season on the first day and say, yep, time's coming. You trade everybody away as you get into the main season. You build that team, you train, you rehearse, and then you execute. That's what we have to do. The core element is the human dimension, and we've got to maintain that. It doesn't just make our team stronger and help prevent the harmful behavior that we've got to eradicate from our force. It builds the readiness for our next priority, which is winning the first fight. Again, the Army is a human endeavor, and it's all about winning that first fight. And if and when that first fight comes, it'll likely be in large-scale combat operation. Large-scale combat operations. That's different than the past 20 years of continuous conflict of what we've watched, that we've been a part of. It's going to be harder, it's going to come faster, and it's going to be one hell of a lot more lethal than what we've experienced. And for that, we know that we're going to need to maintain true proficiency at that squad, at the crew, at the team, at the platoon level, but we also have to elevate our capability. We have to elevate it moving up the echelon and set to conditions and synchronized warfighting functions at the battalion level and above. You've got to have the ability to be able to be predictive, identify transitions, setting the conditions for that first element. I would say a good formation, a good young element can run through an obstacle. Team leader, squad leader, platoon leader, they see it, they take it, and they move to the next one. If you've got a good higher headquarters with the experience, you've been predictive. You know where that obstacle is going to be. You've got the capability and resources and all the warfighting functions. You reduce that so that that squad platoon can just move forward without engaging it. And then you know where the next one comes. Over time, that's what higher headquarters have to do. And we haven't trained that as well as we've done. We're good, but we've got to be great because the division is going to be the unit of action in the future, not the brigade. And in large-scale combat operations, if we can't set conditions from the theater to the core to the division to the brigade all the way down, we're going to suffer when the first soldier initiates fire. We've got to get to that level. And for that, I'm also looking at the sustainers. How many loggies are out there? Excellent. I love you. And here's why. Because we talk about winning that fight. We can't win at the point of contact if we don't have the formation that can get to the fight or maintain it in the fight. And we've seen that. I just saw in the last couple NTC rotations, 87 tanks in, a, in an armor brigade. And when you're down to 20 of them, you're not going to be successful. That's maintaining. That's being predictive and getting the maintainers on the tank and knowing what they're doing. You've got to have the resources if you're going to win the fight. We also have to conserve and invest resources, as we talk about the first fight, as we win for the future fight. Temporal nature, our pacing threats China. We look at it today if you're a combatant commander, but for leaders in the room, we have to look at it in five years, 10 years, 50 years. In order to get there, the Army's going to have to talk a lot about what to do over the next few days here at AUSA, what those resources need to be, because we're transforming. We have to. We're becoming more data-driven, we're becoming more efficient, and we're going to rely on the Guard and Reserve to give us that strategic discipline in modernizing the total Army through the right time horizons, committing these four masons, the 2nd 107th, so we can rotate elements off to go through modernization, retrain, and commit for the next fight. Because at the end of the day, and this is only our fourth and final line of effort, the only way that we can win is a balanced total army. We have to be. And we're going to do this by investing in the multi-compo interoperability. If we can't communicate, we don't have the same equipment, you're not going to be effective. We're going to be prioritizing training and new equipment for units forecasted for the Title X mobilizations. Second 107 is a great example of that. And by getting the right capabilities, both immediately available in the active force, but then also within arm's reach of the Guard and Reserves, for a protracted LISCO fight. It will not be a quick win. It'll take time and resources and everybody from all three compos to be committed to that fight and to be ready for that fight in order to dominate. So that's where ForceCom is going. Those are my four priorities I'm putting out. I just gave you a little pre-read of my 90-day assessment. And uh, we've got to win the trust. We've got to win the first fight. We've got to win the future fight. And we have to win as a total army.
And we didn't try to be subtle about the running theme between lines of effort. Winning matters. Winning matters. It's why we serve, and it's what our fellow Americans rightly expect and deserve of our Army. It's also what we expect of ourselves, and we should. It feels good to be part of a winning team. Everybody wants to be a champion. We all know the feeling. When you and your fellow soldiers, they trust each other, built over time, experience, you train. You don't train till you get it right one time and high five. You train over and over again till you can't get it wrong. When you're dreaming about it, look at my cadets right there as they go out there to be platoon leaders, over and over again. I told you this starts with leadership and strong non-commissioned officers. They truly are the backbone, but it also takes hard work. And I know anything about the Guard and the Reserve, hard work's in your blood. It has to be. So if anyone has the capacity, the discipline, and the ability to commit to yet another hard yet rewarding year of service, it's the Guard and Reserve soldiers who are working, or they're going to school full time, taking care of their families full time, representing our Army values full time, and staying trained and ready full time, even only when you're wearing the uniform, potentially for only 39 or so days a year. Same standards exacted, same standards expected, full time. We call it a part-time job, it's not. It's a full-time commitment. I want to thank each and every one of you for serving alongside and supporting our total Army. Relying on you to make the most of this year's AUSA discussions, they do matter, they do inform, and they give that perspective that only you have from your personal experiences. And we need your help to recruit and to build the strongest, most ready and modern total force Army possible today. I've got nothing but the depth of respect for each and every one of you and for your compos. We fought alongside each other literally for years in combat. And there's a trust that's built, and we have to continue to build upon that trust. Thank you, Freedom's Guardian. Uh, General Pappas, thank you so much for your remarks, but thank you even more for your leadership, both now and the future. We know our soldiers are going to be in good hands when you've got leaders like this leading the way for them. On behalf of AUSA, we do have a little gift for you. I don't know if you play cards or not, but this is a deck of cards. Uh, but this is a special deck of cards. I actually haven't seen them because it's still wrapped. But from what I was told, every face card is a Medal of Honor winner. So enjoy these, and thank you again Thanks, for your sir. service. Thanks for the opportunity to come. Yes. Ooh, let me find my place. Thanks to each of the associations for joining us this morning. We appreciate what you've done as you look after soldiers, their families, and their priorities. And I do mean that with a, uh, a heavy heart. It's not just about a soldier. A soldier can't be a soldier without a family. And so we have to look after their families. So for all of you out there that are involved with family support, family programs, other types of things to support our families so that our soldiers can do what they do. Thank you. Again, thank you to our sponsor, Light Fighter, uh, which is represented by Rich Coaches, Kay and Mike. I'm proud to say our membership in the AUSA has grown over 270,000 members. So we're growing as an organization. And why is that important? It's important, and you can ask Guy Swan over here because he knows, is because when we talk to Congress about what our soldiers need, what our service needs in terms of budget, in terms of equipment, in terms of training, it's just not one person saying, I need this. 
it's over 270,000 pe people saying, we need this. And oh, by the way, we vote. So the more we grow, the stronger we get, the more support we can get for our soldiers and their families. I'd like to encourage you, if you're not already a member, to join. We have several new flexible membership options to try to make it easy and affordable. So stop by the AUSA Pavilion. Those wishing to attend the opening ceremony for the annual meeting, you're invited to do so. It's always a big event, a chance to hear from the Secretary of the Army, a chance to hear from the Chief Staff of the Army, as well as a good entertaining show usually for the opening. The annual meeting badges you are wearing will allow you inside the ballroom and allow you to tour the exhibits when they open later today. Also, this is not part of the script, but I would encourage you, if you haven't already planned so, get downstairs and see the exhibits. It is always eye-opening to me. I'm 70 years old, so, so I lose track of things and everything. But I get down there and I go, holy cow. When did they develop this and why didn't I have this? <laughs> I could have used it. Uh, so get down there, see some old friends, but also see what's new and on the horizon. Uh, if you do not have a badge yet, please stop by Registration Center and the Convention Center to pick them up. The ceremony, the opening ceremony begins over in the Convention Center at 930. So get over there in plenty of time because you got to get up the escalator and everything. Again, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, as was mentioned, this is really the first time we've actually been able to get back together as a group uh, and have breakfast and, and celebrate. And it's, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Your attendance here signifies how much you support our Army. So thanks for being here and enjoy the rest of the week with AUSA. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah.